Hello everyone, welcome to What If Deku Has the Ability of Blacklight Virus Prototype Part 9. Before we start please go support Dummy wearing a hoodie for writing that awesome fanfic. Now let's begin. Chapter 28.2 Class 1A vs Mercer of Class 1A. Previously, now. How about Round 2? Mercer said, causing the creatures with him to roar as they charged forward. The class were in shock and shaking in fear as the hunters growled in their direction. How could they forget that he can do this? Looking over at their class representative, they could see the sadistic smile on his face. Something that didn't look good on his face, but at the same time fit him. Before any of them could do anything, bandages wrapped themselves around Mercer's body and neck. Tightening the hold on the blacklight user. Surrender now, or I'll choke you to death. A voice said from behind him. Turning to the owner of the voice, the mock villain saw Shinso, in his full black costume, similar to a racer head, he also has the scarf around his neck. He could see the uncertainty in the boy's eyes. The mock villain smirked. Do it he said quickly. Shinso's eyes widened when he didn't feel Izuku's response triggering his quirk. Narrowing his eyes, he spoke up again. Tell your hunters to stand down. He said while pulling the scarf harder to tighten the hold. Hunters? He knew something was wrong as soon as Izuku's smirk grew wider. Charge yelled, breaking free of the scarf with ease. He lunged towards Shinso, who was still surprised at the scarf getting destroyed. But Shinso mentally yelled as he tried his best to jump away from the verdette. Transforming his arm into his musclemus and Mercer punched the indigo-haired boy on the cheek, sending him flying to the building wall, with a loud thud. The hunters charged forward to the other students, who frantically avoided the creatures as the mock villain made his way to Shinso, who was trying to stand up, albeit shakily. As the green-haired teen was about to attack Shinso, a wall of ice stopped him from getting close. Looking to the side, he saw Todoroki clutching his side. He was about to charge at the dual-haired boy when a kick hit him from behind, courtesy of Iida, sending him flying to the direction of Todoroki. Now, Todoroki he heard Iida yell, making him look over at Todoroki's direction, who began summoning a large wave of ice to his flying form. Landing hard on the ice wave, ice shards and dust particles exploded in the area, making those around them close their eyes. As the dust particles slowly dissipated, they noticed that Todoroki was limping forward, clutching his sides. That was the same time where the hunters slumped down and turned into piles of tendrils. The tense atmosphere lightened up as they began cheering. They had won and passed the exam. But no announcement of the end of the exam was announced. The teachers were on the edge of their seats as their eyes were glued to the screen. Even if it looked like Midoriya was somehow defeated, they knew better than that. Even the impatient present Mick didn't say anything as they watched Todoroki emerge from the smoke cloud and the rest of Class 1A beginning to celebrate. Waiting in anticipation as they wait for Midoriya's next move. Completely forgetting that this was supposed to be an exam. Through the celebration, Katsuki narrowed his eyes as he stared at Todoroki, who was limping towards Melissa of all people. He expected Icy Hot to go to round face or four eyes or even ponytail, but not towards Melissa was oddly suspicious. His suspicion was warranted when he saw Todoroki's unconscious body lying on the ground as the smoke dissipated, the direction where Todoroki came from. The imposter began smirking as his heterochromia eyes turned red. His mo girl, look out he called out, propelling forwards to the girl's direction. Said girl jumped at the yell and barely dodged a claw slash to her palm. Channeling 10% of one for all as her body was enveloped by yellow sparks of lightning, she sent a kick towards the imposter, who slowly turned back into Izuku. Shoot style. Texas smash. The kick landed on the boy's left arm that he used to block the attack, causing a shockwave to explode from the two students. The attack didn't phase the blacklight user, who was about to punch the blonde girl if it weren't for Katsuki sending an explosion to his face. Seeing that the mock villain is stunned, Melissa used this chance to grab Mercer's arm and hurled him across the street. The verdette landed on a nearby building, crashing into the glass window. Seeing an opportunity, Katsuki yelled out. Everyone fall back he said as he propelled towards Todoroki's unconscious body and carried him away. The class followed suit as they booked it out of there. In this situation, regrouping is the most logical thing to do. The class were nowhere to be seen when Izuku emerged from the building he crashed into. Shaking off the glass shards on his body, he used his sonar senses to look for his classmates and spotted them immediately. He was about to run after them when he looked over at his arm and saw blood. His eyes narrowed, he couldn't remember if he even got injured or anything. Wanting to make sure, Izuku channeled black light and consumed it with a tendril swirling around his arm. He waited for memories to enter his mind, but nothing came. Shrugging it off, Izuku walked towards the pile of mass that came from the hunters. He intentionally made the creature to summon to make his classmates drop their guard. It worked but not fully. Consuming the two piles, he walked towards the other one and touched it. The pile began pulsing before it came back to life as a brawler hunter. The creature looked over at its master and waited for orders. Izuku huffed in amusement. Looking straight to its eyes, he spoke up. Brawler. 
The monster perked up as a smirk formed on its master's face. Smash. As soon as he said that, the creature roared before jumping away towards a nearby car and began slashing and pounding on it. Its loud crashing sounds echoed in the area as Izuku sat down in a meditative position. Let's see what my dear classmate's planning now. He thought as he closed his eyes and activated Hive Mind. Class 1A realized that Mercer got their backs against the wall. Sounds of crashes rang out in the streets as the class jumped, ran, and swung over a broken down car. Looks of uncertainty can be seen on some of their faces as they hear some of the building's glass windows crash as roars coming from the hunter filled the place. Are we far enough? Iida said, panting as he looked over at Jiro and Shoji. Plugging her earphone jacks, Jiro closed her eyes as Shoji extended his duply arm. After a few moments, the two nodded. This made them sigh in relief as they groaned at their injuries. Itsuki slowly placed down Shoto, who was beginning to gain consciousness. He slumped down the walls as he hissed in pain while wiping the blood coming out of his busted lip. The plan didn't work like how they expected it to be. Screw that, he knew damn well that the plan wasn't going to work in the first place with Izuku's overpowered quirk, even with the limiters on. Ever since the exam started, Class 1A had been in a disarray of arguments and misunderstandings. There had been a problem with the planning portion before the start of the exam. You see, during the planning portion, Momo, being one of the smartest of the class, suggested that they should all split up in four different groups going in different directions, as a way to make it hard for Izuku to attack all of them at once. With this strategy, the class will be able to cover a lot more ground and be able to finish the test. Itsuki nodded at the idea but asked for different suggestions, since her plan was a bit too risky for those with non-combatant quirks and lacks experience in fighting. Oru also pointed out that Izuku has thermal vision, making it easy for him to locate their direction. Hiroshima then suggested that they take Izuku hat on and overwhelm him with their numbers advantage. A suggestion that Katsuki immediately declined on doing, arguing that Izuku has more experience in fighting multiple opponents and in fighting in general, since he is now pro-hero. That's when Melissa suggested that the class surround their class president and overwhelm him with attacks to somehow weaken him and for them to easily capture him. A plan that Katsuki doubted would work but couldn't say anything due to his classmates agreements. Something that he would regret right now. That damned nerd got us good, he got us real good. He thought as he took a deep breath before smirking. So what now? He heard Shinso ask, panting slightly and hissing at his bruised cheek. What's the plan? The class looked over at Momo, who was a bit pale due to her overusing her quirk. She was looking down on the ground. They could see the look of frustration in the raven-haired girl's face as she slowly shook her head. I don't know. She shakily said as a single tear began to crawl down her cheeks. I d don't know. The class looked over to the second smartest person in their group, Melissa, who was looking down thoughtfully as she wrapped bandages over her injured palm. The same frustrated expression can be seen in her face. As Katsuki was about to speak, Achako spoke up. Himi, are you okay? Amiko can be seen head lowered as if she was sleeping, which worried Achako, since the blonde girl suddenly was asleep. The brunette shakes the other girl, attempting to wake her up. Her attempts of waking her friend up was halted when Himiko suddenly slashed the knife in her hand towards Achako, who quickly dodged her. The class jumped away as Himiko began to stand up, confused as buck to why their classmate suddenly attacked Achako. Her head still lowered. Toga, what are you doing? Iida yelled out to the girl. The others have the same thought in their minds. Their questions were answered when the transform user lifted her head. Class 1A widened their eyes to see the girl's yellow slitted eyes are now appearing in a crimson hue with black squares. I'm sorry, but Himiko is not available right now. Please try your call later. Toga said as she lunged forward and began slashing her knives towards the group. The class were shocked at this, but the most shocked was Katsuki. He almost thought that Izuku had followed them and disguised himself as Toga, but seeing that she didn't use any of his abilities, it doesn't appear to be that way. It appears that Izuku had somehow controlled the blonde girl. Seriously, Midoriya. Just how many skills can you just pull out of your ass to catch us off guard? He thought as he dodged a swipe to his neck. She began charging towards the closest person, Aoyama, who was still clutching his stomach. The self-proclaimed French student panicked and sent a laser towards the blonde girl. Achako was worried that her friend was about to get hit. Luckily, Toga jumped over the laser and was about to perform a downward slash when Shinso wrapped her with his scarf and pulled her down, letting Achako pinned to the ground. The brunette did her best to keep the pale blonde girl pinned using gunhead martial arts. Himiko kept on squirming for a few minutes until she suddenly flinched. Well, what's going on? Himiko said, voice shocked and somehow back to her usual tone. Before the class could answer her and ask her questions for her actions, present Mick's voice echoed throughout the area. Fifteen minutes left, this caused the class to suddenly begin panicking. They had no plan to somehow pass this test. Mina and Denki began to feel depressed. 
Their plans of being in the summer camp, the training, the test of courage, the campfire stories, and the most important thing of all. S'mores. Everything is getting out of their grasp. The others grimaced at their injuries. They had felt like they were just way out of Izuku's league and being toyed with by their class rep. However, Momo and Melissa were the most depressed, looking as they, the smartest in the group, couldn't think of a plan. The latter of the two being that the quirk her uncle might had entrusted on her has little effect on their opponent. Though, it may be understandable due to her being new and using one for all. This highly affected their confidence. Katsuki saw all of this and clenched his teeth. Despite his change of character, he is still Katsuki Bakugo. He hates losing and to see his classmates giving up without even trying annoyed him. However, even he is unsure on how to win this battle. This feels like a David and Goliath match. The only difference is their Goliath is on steroids and is more stabby stabby. So what other way do they need to do to win? They could always escape to win, but that is a coward's way out of this predicament. At least for him. Looking over at his classmates, he furrowed his eyebrows to see that some of them were injured and exhausted. But he could still see the small spark of determination in their eyes filled with despair. Taking a calming breath to himself, he slapped himself in the face with his palms. Before turning his game face on. Turning his head to his classmates, he scowled. This is getting nowhere. We need to go and fight him. As soon as he said that, he turned to the direction where Izuku was. Everyone looked at him with shock. He saw that Kirishima was looking at him with a look of concern on his face. Before anyone could talk, the explosive boy continued. But we need to do things differently this time. He looked at them and crossed his arms. Even from the start, I knew that the plan was going to fail. This caused gasps to echo in the area. Before Iida could confront him about not speaking up, Kitsuki raised his hand. I didn't say anything because I didn't have an idea on what to do. Not entirely a lie but who's counting. Seeing that our asses got kicked by the nerd, it's really obvious that I was right. This caused Momo to lower her head. Echako patted her back. But to be frank, I think it helped us in another way. It made us realize that even with our numbers advantage, we can't take him head on. That damn nerd is way too crafty for his own good. I hate to admit it, but Izuku is not on our level. He said, looking at his closed fist. So what do you propose, Bakugo? Tenya spoke up, removing his slightly dented helmet. Itsuki looked at his palm before looking up to his classmates. I say we take him on from a distance. Crashes and roars still echoed as the brawler hunter tore down a two-story building. Mercer was still in his meditative pose, taking deep breaths as a way to calm himself down. The recent hive mind attempt was draining in his part since it was his first time using it on a human, making it difficult for him to control. The minute had passed since present Mick announced the 15-minute mark. He used this as a chance to be able to replenish his energy. Not his biomass though, he forgot to bring his protein bars. Something that may or may not have been accidental. His eyes then opened when he heard his flyer squawking from the sky. Looking up, he let it perch on his shoulder. Activating sonar senses, he was confused to see his classmates scattered around the area. Standing up as he consumed the flyer, he planned to ambush them. Before he could do anything, he saw movement from the corner of his eye. Looking over it, he was met with a barrage of pigeons and crows coming from two different directions. He was pushed back a few meters. Using pop-off, Mercer summoned dragon wings to cover himself up before flapping it as strong as he could to send the avians away from him. As he did that, he was forced to jump away as Iida charged him with speed unseen from the speedster. Evading a kick from the tall boy, Mercer noticed liquid on the concrete. Seeing that this liquid traced a trail from Iida, he was confused. That's until he noticed a mop of pink hair peeking out from the building. This. This is Mina's quirk. So she can now alter her acid's viscosity and acidity. A ghost of a smile appeared on his face. Impressive. His train of thought was interrupted when Kirishima, Sado, Ajiro, and Shoji suddenly emerged from the surrounding buildings. Something that caused confusion for the mock villain. How did they get here so fast? His question was left unanswered as he barely dodged two fists coming straight to his face, one being hardened due to Kirishima's quirk. Flipping over the two, Mercer was met with a tail slap from Ajiro, sending him flying to Shoji's arms, which tightened at him as he heard something click on his left hand. Panicking, he headbutted the taller boy, making the hold loosen before kicking him away from him. Jumping away from the melee students, he could feel his body weakening as his legs began to shake. Looking down his left hand, he gritted his teeth as he saw a different colored quirk suppression cuff strapped tightly at his wrist. The quirk suppressors that Nezu had him wear were black in color, while this new cuff was silver. Raising his head, he was about to glare at his classmates when a wave of ice and lightning was quickly coming straight to his direction. Jumping to the side to avoid the incoming elements, he failed to foresaw the tape and scarf that latched onto his leg. No hard feelings, Midoriya he heard Sura yell out before he was pulled back to the ice wall. 
his back hitting the cold surface of the wall of ice, and the stinging feeling of the lightning coursing through his body. Though Koyami now he heard Shinso yell, before the tape and scarf let go of him. As he was falling to the ground, Dark Shadow tackled him to the ground as another click was hurt on his other arm. Using his free hand, he summoned an ember of Todoroki's fire quirk and slammed it on the sentient quirk. That caused the shadow to hiss in pain and retreat back to its owner. He stood up back to his feet, albeit shaking due to the lightning attack still having an effect on his body. Plus, the fact that he is low on biomass due to the added suppressors on his limbs right now didn't help him. Damn it I let my guard down. He thought as did his best to balance himself. The mock villain glanced at the brawler's direction and saw that it was preoccupied with Tenya, Kitsuki, and Melissa. Where are you looking at, Izuku? Widening his eyes, Mercer looked to the side and was met with a tongue wrapping itself tightly around his body as he was pulled away to the side. Sigh. He thought as he saw the familiar dark green hue of long hair. As he was being pulled, he felt a hand slapping him on the back. Looking back, he saw Yuraka looking back at him with determination. He could feel his center of gravity shift. The tongue around him loosened as he was thrown to the side. The momentum of the throw made him face the direction where he is getting thrown. His eyes widened when he saw a makeshift cage waiting for him with a Himiko holding the door open. Not wanting to be captured, he spread his arms out and used tendrils to attach to the light posts. The biomass stretched as he continued sailing to the cage. To his luck, he was only as few feet to the cage before he rocketed back as the tendrils retracted, throwing him away like an angry bird flying out of a slingshot. His classmate's jaws dropped at the green-haired boy. He had just dodged another bullet. Izuku panicked for a bit as he released his tendrils. He was feeling a bit exhausted due to his shortage of biomass. He began to overthink until he saw a glimpse of his brawler as it slapped Bakugo away. Seeing an opening, he used his glide to quicken his momentum. As he neared the brawler, he summoned his claws. I'm sorry, BH. He whispered as he stabbed the creature on the head. His quirk's biomass began to wrap around the brawler's head. It pained him to hear the brawler shriek in pain as he began consuming it. Landing on the ground and fully absorbing the creature, Izuku could feel his energy being replenished. Looking around his classmates, he saw that they were shocked at what just happened. Channeling black light to his arms, he summoned his shield. He was disappointed when he summoned his ordinary shield and not the spiked one, but shrugged nonetheless. It's better than nothing. He was about to charge his classmates when he suddenly felt something inside of his body pulse, forcing him to deactivate his shield. The same feeling that he felt back in USJ after he consumed the Nomu back then. The feeling that something was going to burst out his body. He began to cry in pain as black and red tendrils began to surround his body. Before he knew it, a barrage of tendrils escaped his body in different directions. Crashing to the buildings and cars around him. His classmates frantically tried their best to either dodge the thing or block it. His yell of pain drowned out present Mick's voice, announcing the five-minute mark. As the tendrils stopped, Izuku was left there panting and confused. He had somehow achieved critical mass once again. It is him achieving an excessive amount of health or biomass consumed. This only happened during the USJ incident, where he used consume for the first time of his life. What confused him is how he was able to achieve critical mass at this point when he had trained himself in increasing his biomass storage, making it hard for him to reach critical mass. At least he chose not to reach it due to the destructive nature of it when released. He looked down at his arms and noticed the suppressors. Is it because of the suppressors? Is it because my quirk is being suppressed that it made me reach critical mass faster? He thought between pants. He was still confused at this when his head pulsed as visions of people began to appear in his mind, making him clutch his head. Appearing in his mind are eight figures looking at him with shock and confusion. What he noticed first was a tall, muscular woman that looks like his mom, if it weren't for her black hair and a mole near her right side of her chin, below her lips. He then noticed a figure made of yellow mist, similar to the warping villain, that looks really close to All Might in his skinny form. He was about to approach the figures when he felt hands grip his shoulders and made him stop on his tracks. Looking back, he saw Alex on his right side and a tall, muscular man with a shaved head and a small scar over his left eyebrow. The two looked down at Izuku with a serious expression before shaking their heads. This further confused him as he looked back at the figures and blinked when he saw them fade from existence. As the figures faded, something akin to a hologram appeared in front of him. Within the hologram screen a bunch of what appears to be a bunch of viruses connected to each other. Something that made him raise his eyebrow when he read names of some of his classmates and people he knew, such as Shodo, Azawa, Himiko, and unfortunately Mineta. His thoughts were interrupted when something hit him on the shoulder. Looking down at it, his eyes widened to see two tranquilizer darts stuck on his shoulder. Panicking, he grabbed and pulled it off him. As soon as he did, his vision began to slowly swirl. Damn it I got distracted. He thought as did his best to balance himself. He shook it off as he looked at the trajectory of the darts. 
There he saw Momo, Aoyama, and a pair of gloves Toru on top of a two-story building, holding what appears to be hunting rifles. It appears that one of them had missed their target as he only felt two darts. As he tried desperately to shake off the woozy feeling, Kitsuki emerged from his blind spot and sent an explosion to his face. This sent his weakened body flying to the side as a barrage of nets shot from different directions hit him, trapping him. He tries desperately to break out of the nets, but his fading consciousness has other plans. Izuku took a few failed attempts, panting hard at the tranquilizer is getting the best of him. Slowly, he looked up and saw his classmate standing a few feet away from him. Their expressions ranged from uncertainty, fear, exhaustion, and determination. As he felt his consciousness fading once more, he smiled at his classmates and gave them a shaky thumbs up. Congratulations. Heroes. You caught. Me. Those were his last words before he closed his eyes and slumped down as he let his consciousness slip. There was a moment with silence in the field as Class 1A stared at Izuku's unconscious body. They continued to look at him until the speakers burst out an announcement. The villain has been apprehended the hero team wins as soon as that announcement was called, the class erupted in cheers as they had passed. Everyone, even Katsuki began yelling in victory as the girls began hugging each other. Summer camp here we go the girls plus Kaminari and Sura yelled in their minds. Somewhere in Kamino, the Mura Shigaraki can be seen on the barstool, silently looking over Izuku's picture from the sports festival. A glare can be seen through the eye that the hand on his face was covering. He hadn't forgotten his encounter with a hero student and how he had always been outsmarted by the boy. Albeit, intentionally or unintentionally. That brat. I'll make sure he pays for being a cheater. I'll disintegrate him to bits. Just you wait. He thought as he used his cork to disintegrate the picture. The door of the bar opened and there entered a middle-aged man of moderate height and slight build. Said man has short gray hair worn parted to his right with side bangs above his eyes, along with a goatee on his chin, a small mustache, and one of his teeth seems to be missing, leaving a gap in his grin. Mr. Shigaraki, I came here with the recruits. Said man as he grinned at the decay user. Chapter 29. Day in the Mall. Izuku finds himself waking up on the very familiar looking rooftop carved within his mindscape. The same rooftop where he saw the mysterious figures. The same rooftop where he awakened tendrils. The very same rooftop where he met and bound souls with Alex and gained the blacklight virus and converted it into a quirk. This rooftop brought different emotions into him, but the most notable was the feeling that Alex gave him. Hope. For him to be pulled away from the darkness and be given the light to continue his journey was something that Izuku will always be grateful for Alex and James, the latter for giving him the ability of tendrils and pack leader at his disposal. As he rose up to his feet, he wondered why he was in his mindscape. But his curiosity was halted when he heard shouting near his location. You bucking bastard if I were alive right now, I would have killed you again. Oh James. You know damn well that I let you win in our last fight. Looking over at the direction of the shouts, Izuku saw Alex and James standing near the edge of the building. The former has his arms crossed, leaning on the railing of the roof, while the latter was in front of the former, with his fist clenched in front of his face, visibly shaking as a tick mark can be seen on his shaved head. Izuku could see Alex having an amused expression, while James wore a glare towards the prototype. Though, he was confused how Alex could be here. If his memories weren't playing with, Alex already passed to the afterlife after transferring blacklight into him. Also, how can James be here as well? Um. He said, earning the attention of the two, who looked over at his direction. Ah, Izuku fancy seeing you here Alex smiled and approached Izuku, accidentally bumping James' shoulder, earning a growl. We've been expecting you he said as he approached the green-haired boy and gave his hair a ruffle. Really? He asked and got a nod from the former blacklight wielder. Yes, it has something to do with your recent discovery, Alex said. Specifically, the web of intrigue, the interconnecting viruses that you saw last time. He paused before smirking, causing a confused look to appear on Izuku's face. More on that later, let me introduce to you my dear friend, James Heller. He said and pointed to the other person on the rooftop. Said man growled and gave Alex a glare. I am not your goddamn friend, you bucking bastard James yelled before looking over at Izuku. And I met the kid before, it was after that time he consumed that mothabicking abomination that looked way too similar to you, Mercer. Alex wasn't even phased from the insult as Heller continued. But to make it formal, my name is Sergeant James Heller, and I destroyed Alex Mercer. He said and crossed his arms. Barely destroyed. Alex added, earning another tick mark on the man's forehead, but didn't say anything. Izuku gave the man a slight bow. Nice to meet you sir, I am Izuku Midoriya. Um. The reincarnation of Alex Mercer. He said, whispering the last sentence. Though the two adults heard it and snorted in amusement. Heller looked at Izuku with scrutiny, causing the boy to shift awkwardly on his feet, before turning to Alex. I still don't believe that this kid is your goddamn reincarnation. He's way too polite to be you. He said in a blunt tone. 
Izuku fell down comically as Alex just huffed in amusement. At least he doesn't yell profanities like he owns the place. I'm pretty sure that Bakugo kid is your reincarnation. Alex said teasingly. The other man scoffs. No way in hell that that Sisidibitor is my reincarnation. He sneered. I mean, he's getting better at least. Izuku was cut off when James glared at him. Don't defend him. Right, sorry, he said looking away. Not really comfortable with the subject. Anyway, what's the web of intrigue again? He said changing the topic. As soon as Izuku finished that question, a same holographic screen containing millions if not billions of interconnected viruses appeared in front of them. The amount was overwhelming, even for Alex. Ugh, I could never get used to seeing that many memory fragments in my mind. Alex moaned as he unconsciously rubbed the side of his head. For once, I agree with you. Haller wincingly said, also rubbing the side of his head. Anyway, this Izuku is the web of intrigue. A mental representation of the collection of all of the memory fragments of every person that you and I consumed. Alex said. This allows us to look into the entire life memories of a person in just 10 to 11 seconds, something that you unconsciously do without needing to check into it. However, yours is different. How so? Izuku asked. Alex smiled and looked back on the hologram. James and mine only allows us to look into the person's memory. You on the other hand take it more into a whole new different level. Not only allowing you to look into another person's life, but also allowing you to permanently copy another person's quirk. Quite an interesting feat, if you ask me. He said, making Izuku nod. Additionally, Heller spoke up and touched the hologram. Pinching a random cell, he took it out of the hologram and tossed it towards a shocked Izuku, who clumsily caught it. As you can see, yours can be taken from the web and be either inspected or be crushed, if you want the memory to be erased from the face of the earth, all the while keeping the person's quirk, if they ever have one. Just think about the specific memory or the person you consumed and visualize it being crushed and poof, it will be gone forever. Izuku nodded dumbly at the former US Marine before looking down at the cell. He inspected the memory, and when he saw what the memory contained, he immediately crushed it. This action earned surprised and curious glances from the two adults. Was it that bad? Alex asked. You have no idea. Izuku said in an annoyed tone, shaking his hand in a disgusted way. With that reaction, I think we all know what that memory contained. Alex just gave James a look, the latter shrugging as he crossed his arms. That sums all of it. Do you have any questions? The prototype asked Izuku, who looked back at the hologram as it slowly dissipated and back to the two. There's two actually. He said, earning a nod from the two. Okay, first question. He paused and pointed at James. How are you here? Said man just blinked. That's a good question. He said before thinking for a bit before looking back at the young hero. I think it has something to do with the bastard beside me. Since I am pretty sure I didn't get reincarnated into you as well. Though, that could also be a possibility. He said pointing his finger towards Alex. Ah, yes. That's right. I believe that when our souls merged, a fragment of James' soul containing some of the abilities of the Blacklight virus, such as tendrils, pack leader, and some other miscellaneous skills, had also been inserted within your soul. Alex said, and paused for a second before continuing. There's also that time where I secretly consumed some of his blood to look into his memories. Maybe that was the reason. This earned a reaction from Heller. What the buck why the buck will you look into my memories? Alex merely shrugged. I dunno. I was bored. Why I oughta his yells were interrupted by Izuku. Anyway onto my next question. Izuku said, stopping a fight from starting inside his own mindscape. My other question. Who were those figures I saw before you two stopped me from approaching them? Alex and James were silent at that question. Izuku could see the uncertainty in their faces and grew anxious. It's okay if you two don't want to answer it. He trailed off, only to be interrupted by Alex. They are the previous users of One for All. He said, opting Izuku's eyes to widen. We don't know how they got here, but we stopped you from approaching them because it would have been too dangerous, even for you to equip All Might's quirk. Wah? How so? Izuku asked, confused about all of this. Blacklight and One for All are two of the most powerful quirks in your world. Combining the two will essentially turn you into a god. But both have drawbacks that will cause a lot of damage in your well-being. Making your already highly destructive quirk even more destructive. He said, as a serious expression can be seen on the man's face. We stop you for that very reason. If you ever got a chance to get your hand on one for all, chances of your whole body exploding from the inside out is really likely. This caused chills to spread throughout Izuku's spine. Just the mere thought of his body exploding with that drawback almost made Izuku vomit. That's why one for all and blacklight should never be combined in one body. Alex said, causing Izuku to have a thoughtful look on his face. Izuku's mind was still filled with images of him exploding from the inside out, and it was very unsettling. It was Alex's hand that pushed off those thoughts and he smiled at him. 
That being said, you don't need one for all to become the hero that you always wanted to be, you already have Blacklight. And every other quirk he copied. Heller added. And every other quirk you copied. Alex repeated. Izuku chuckled a bit and nodded. I understand. He said as he felt a faint pulling sensation from his head. He panicked a bit, but Alex only laughed at this. Looks like you're waking up. Good luck out there, Izuku. Congrats on ranking 35th. Same here. Heller said as he saluted the boy. The current blacklight wielder nodded and thanked them. It took him five seconds to fully fade away, leaving the two in his mindscape. Making sure that Izuku was fully gone, James looked over at Alex. Why did you lie about blacklight and one for all? He asked the hooded man, who just looked at him with a raised eyebrow. I don't know what you mean. Don't give me that crap, Mercer. You and I know damn well that that kid wouldn't have any problem wielding both blacklight and one for all. He narrowed his eyes on the original prototype. So why the hell did you lie to him about that? Alex looked up into the red sky with uncharacteristic melancholy on his face. So that history won't repeat itself, he whispered. I did so many despicable things in the world when I was alive, and I barely felt remorse in all of my actions, thinking it was the right thing to do. The moment you came and put an end to my chaotic reign was the moment where I felt the most human throughout my life as the blacklight virus. To be feared and to be hated for something that I thought would change the world for the better was something that I wouldn't want Izuku to feel. James stared at the man before him and couldn't help but sigh. He was still mad at him for all of the chaos and destruction he did and all the innocent lives he had killed. He was sure that the man was heartless and had no emotion at all. But looking at the man in front of him right now made him think otherwise. If you say so. Looking at the red sky within Izuku's mind, he was willing to trust the man in his judgment. Anyway. Why the buck did you look into my memories, Mercer? Alex shrugged, not looking back at him. I dunno. I was bored. Answer the damn question, you buck. Izuku looked up to the front door of the 1A Heights Alliance or Class 1AS dorm room. It had been two weeks since they all had moved into the dorms. He moved in the dorms, alongside his mom and Eerie, the latter two staying in the UA staff, sleeping quarters as a way to keep Eerie safe from any other members of the Eight Bullets looking for her, while Linko helped out on taking care of Eerie, who had now been officially named Eerie Midoriya, adopted daughter of Izuku Midoriya. As soon as Izuku woke up from his meeting with Alex and James, he found himself being whacked by a recovery girl with her cane. The school nurse scolded him for being way too reckless and not even holding back in fighting his classmates in an exam. The only thing saving him from getting hurt is his shock absorption evolving into nullification. Talk about a clutch moment. He defended himself by saying it was Nezu's idea. The nurse halted her cane assault on the boy and gave Nezu a glare, which had caused a bead of sweat to form on the fur of the chimera. The chimera then gave him praises for his performance and how he made his classmates think under pressure. Though he was thankful for the praises, he couldn't help but feel guilty and mad at himself for almost fatally harming them due to him not holding back. If it weren't for Midnight squeezing him between her bountiful chests, he would have snapped out of his self-loathing. That caused a wave of laughter from the UA staff and a grumble from Izawa. After Recovery Girl checked for more damages, he was given permission to leave to get some rest. Izuku sighed and suppressed a yawn from escaping his mouth, still feeling the after-effects of the tranquilizer darts that were shot at him. Shaking the drowsiness off his system, though failing miserably, he took a few steps towards the front door. Despite Midnight's attempt of calming him down, he couldn't help but still feel bad for almost losing control of his actions during the exams. He had almost killed some of his classmates due to some of his attacks. And the worst thing about it was enjoying all of it. Just the thought of himself enjoying the fight or hurting his classmates made him sick. That's why he was so frustrated as he tossed the car with one hand. Sighing, Izuku placed his hand on the doorknob and turned it before pushing it open. Uncertainty and anxiety crept their way in his mind as he entered the dorm. Walking in and looking around the dorm, he felt his anxiety slowly lowered as he observed his classmates. Despite their bandages around their bodies due to what had happened in the final exams, he could see their eyes filled with excitement and happiness as they conversed with each other about their plans in the camp. Some of them saw him and approached him asking questions if he was alright, prompting him to wave them off. He congratulated his classmates for passing and apologized for hurting them too badly, to which they told him it was fine. Smiling, Izuku excused himself to go to his room and maybe even take a nap due to the after-effects of the trank darts. They nodded at him and asked if he wanted to join them in their trip to the mall tomorrow morning. He agreed and went to his room. As he reached his room, Izuku plopped down his bed and dropped unconscious. Tomorrow is going to be another busy day. Good thing it was a rest day. Just shopping with his classmates. What could possibly go wrong? The Ashi Ward Shopping Mall. In the midst of the bustling chatter of people shopping or exploring the Kiyashi Ward Shopping Mall, Izuku found himself running for his life as a group of fangirls chased after him as soon as he and his classmates entered the shopping mall. 
damned fangirls and damned Kaminari for sharing their location in Herogram, even tagging him in his Herogram update, he mentally noted that he would break Kaminari's fingers when he gets out of this situation. Separated from his group, Izuku, desperate to escape the sea of growing fangirls, he entered the men's restroom and closed it shut. Leaning on the restroom door, he could hear the fangirls murmuring outside and realized that they weren't going to leave the entrance exit of the restroom. He was stuck in a really sticky situation right now. And none of his classmates will be able to help, considering that the fangirls might go after them if they interfere with the chase. So much for a rest day. Izuku thought to himself, sighing as he could still hear the chattering and squeals from the girls outside and began brainstorming ideas to leave the place unsuspected. He can't go out using a window as an escape route since the fangirls would most likely surround the area to prevent him from escaping. He could always use his hero status to drive them away, but that would cause a lot of attention. Last thing he wants is attention and stress from all of these fangirls. If only I can use my quirk. He thought to himself and froze. It took him three seconds before he fascipened. He can always use his quirk if it was an emergency, and this is definitely an emergency. Channeling black light all over his body, he used disguise. Outside the men's restroom, as all of the fangirls waited, the door opened. All of the fangirls turned to the door and were ready to lunge at the person who exited the room only to deadpan when they saw Shota Azawa exit the door. They immediately ignored him and went back to waiting as the underground hero exited the door with ease. Unbeknownst to the fangirls, Azawa was grinning like a madman as he walked away from the rabbit group. Making sure to keep a great distance from the fangirls, he took a left turn to walk under the escalator and walk to the other side, emerging as Izuku's blacklight retracted back into him. The shit-eating grin still appeared on the green-haired boy's face as he successfully escaped the rabid fangirls all the while, informing the security that there was a large group of girls loitering outside the men's bathroom. Mission success. Respect plus he thought as he texted his classmates. Now to break Kaminari's fingers he thought as he maniacally cackled in his mind, almost sounding like Nezu, as a certain blonde-haired boy began shivering in fear. His mental insanity was interrupted when he accidentally bumped into someone. As they collided, both fell to the ground. Izuku immediately apologized as he began picking up the scattered bags of marshmallows on the tiled floor. As he picked up all of the fallen items before placing them in a paper bag, he looked at the person he bumped into and had to suppress a blush from forming on his face as his eyes met hers. Dark green eyes met Cerulean as he was met face to face with a girl with shoulder length, bob-shaped black hair side swept to her right with a shorter strand hanging above her eyes. The expression on the girl's face was neutral, but he could see flashes of emotion in her piercing Cerulean eyes. Slowly standing up, Izuku stepped forward and stretched his arm towards the girl. Are you okay? Can you stand? He asked with concern. Not wanting to ruin her cute outfit consisting of a white turtleneck sweater and a chestnut plaid skirt, only a few centimeters above her knees, over black stockings and pink doll shoes. The girl only stared at the outstretched hand and nodded before taking the hand and letting Izuku pull her up. Izuku handed her the paper bag and apologized one more time. The girl only nodded at him before walking away from him, earning a concerned look from Izuku, who guiltily watched a girl disappear in the sea of people in the shopping mall. As the girl walked away from the young hero, she was met with a very familiar Itsuka Kendo and the rest of the girls from class 1B, who were all chatting about how excited they were for the camp. Itsuka noticed the girl's sudden change of demeanor, even though there was barely even a change. Curiosity getting the best of her, Itsuka placed her hand on the other girl's shoulder. Hey Yui, you okay? You seem kinda flustered. She asked a girl, now introduced as Yui. Yui opened her mouth to speak, but closed it immediately as she nodded timidly, her cheeks and ears began to heat up, causing all of the girls to look at each other in shock and confusion. Walking around, Izuku can be seen carrying shopping bags filled with camping supplies, training weights, snack and candies for Eerie who unfortunately couldn't come to the camp, and some marshmallows and chocolates, as a request from Achako and Mina, as they want to make s'mores there. After escaping the fangirls and his encounter with that beautiful girl, he had met up with his classmates. They then split into pairs, and there were only odd numbers of students, since some of them are either busy, don't want to come or are too lazy, meaning one of them can go with a pair or go alone. Being alone for the majority of the beginning of their shopping trip, Izuku volunteered to be the solo shopper, much to the dismay of the girls. He left the group, not without warning Kaminari to stop tagging him in his herogram updates if he wants to still have 10 fingers by the end of the school year. Now that Izuku got everything on his list, he made his way to the central area and sat down on the bench surrounding a palm tree as he watched the crowd of people walk by. Occasionally waving at kids who recognized him. He was minding his own business when another person sat next to him. You're the kid from the sports festival, right? I'm a big fan the person next to him said. He was about to greet the man when he felt four fingers grabbed onto his neck. It's been a while since we last saw each other, Izuku Midoriya. 
the man said. That voice, he could never forget that voice. The voice that laughed at their suffering back in USJ. The voice that ordered the Nomu to beat the crap out of his teachers. The voice that was responsible for the injuries that not only he but everyone who were in USJ when the attack happened. Only one person met that criteria. And it was someone Izuku was far too eager to meet again, to teach the man a lesson to not mess with UA. The Murashigaraki. He said with venom in his tone. This earned a sinister chuckle that escaped the man's lips, as the grip on Izuku's neck tightened but didn't faze him. Make one move and all of my fingers will touch your neck. When that happens, you'll start crumbling to dust. From your skin to your throat, to you he was cut off when Izuku interrupted him. Do it then. I dare you. Six words. It only took six words to make Shigaraki fumble. He looked at the brat with narrowed eyes, only to see that the young hero was staring right back at him with red piercing eyes. Ignoring the odd sense of deja vu in his chest, Shigaraki changed the topic. Answer this, Midoriya. The USJ, the Nomis, all brushed to the side. The hero killer does the same thing. But everything he does, overshadows me. We do the same thing, but what makes us different? The question caused a bit of confusion on Izuku's part. He would have been sure that Stain worked for the League of Villains because of the Nomis back in Hosu City. Turns out he was wrong. Izuku slowly opened his mouth while not breaking eye contact. Shigaraki waited for his response, ignoring the itchy feeling in the man's neck. I plead the fifth. Izuku said, without hesitation. Shigaraki blinked once, twice, thrice. That's when the words registered into the man's mind. His teeth grinded with each other as veins bulge out of his forehead. Hmm. Big words for a pile of dust. You do know I could kill you right here, right now. Right. He said in a growl to the boy as a way to intimidate him, but the boy's gaze never faltered as he continued to stare at him. I beat All Might's personal record in the entrance exam. I defeated your little pet back in the USJ and forced you to escape. I won the whole sports festival. I trained under Mirko for my internship and was able to capture Stain on my own in my first internship, then became the youngest hero in Japan the day after. Defeated high-ranking villains and gave my entire class a run for their money while my quirk is being suppressed in half. He said without breaking eye contact. I did all of that in just my freshman year as a hero core student. So what makes you think I'm afraid of a man-child like you? Then perish unable to hold his own temper. Shigaraki lowered his last finger on the boy's throat. Izuku's throat began crumbling as the young hero let out a choked scream. Arms flailing as pain erupted from his throat as his consciousness began to fade. Well, at least that's what Shigaraki expected. All of his fingers were down, but nothing happened. No choked screaming, no throats disintegrating, no arm flailing. Just a green-haired boy glaring. It had confused Shigaraki. His confusion was cut off when he felt a tense feeling coming from the person he is holding right now. Looking over at the boy, his eyes widened to see that the sclera of his eyes were now pitch black, with his crimson eye glaring daggers at him. His chest felt like it was exploding due to his heartbeat banging like drums. Is this the feeling of fear? The Murashigaraki. I'll give you exactly five seconds to let go of me and calmly leave this place before I cut your arm off. Izuku said. One. Tamura didn't make a move, thinking he was bluffing. Two. Izuku said as his quirk began enveloping his arm, earning Shigaraki's attention. 3. His quirk tightened on his arm and began to take the shape of his blade. 4. Izuku said and slowly raised his arm near the man-child's hand. Hi Izuku didn't get to finish counting when Shigaraki pushed his neck away, forcing Izuku to stumble back. Izuku looked back at the villain and was about to charge him, when a very familiar black mist appeared out of nowhere and began covering the decay user. He watched with narrowed eyes as Shigaraki gritted his teeth. Mark my words, Izuku Midoriya. I will kill you and I will do it slowly and painfully he said as he was completely covered by the black mist, and just like that, he was nowhere to be seen. Chapter 30. Summer Camp Experience. For the love of God, Shoto quit calling me your brother-in-law Izuku's voice echoed throughout Yue's schoolyard. His face beat red as he sent a glare towards his friend, who wasn't even phased. Why not Shoto asked, tilting his head. You saved my mom and sister's life from a villain. You are worthy of continuing the Todoroki bloodline with your own. How does that even make any sense? Izuku yelled indignantly. And besides, I'm not even in a relationship with your sister, yet. Shoto said, cutting him off. Yet I mean, no I don't even know her that well and just interacted with her once. And that interaction was just her thanking me for saving her he said, his face blushing like a storm. Well, that can easily be arranged, brother-in-law. The dual-colored haired boy said with a shrug. Stop calling me that Izuku yelled, activating erasure in the process. His annoyance reached new heights. Hein, I'll stop calling you brother-in-law. He said, earning an indignant thank you from Izuku, but continued talking. I'll call you dad instead. You son of a that was the moment where Iida chose to jump in between, before Izuku could tear Todoroki to shreds. 
The taller boy barely held Izuku back as Todoroki continued walking towards the bus waiting for them outside Yue's walls. Izuku was still blushing in embarrassment and annoyance as he followed the ice fire user, while most of the guys in class 1A, including Katsuki, snorted in amusement, while the girls just looked on with varying looks of jealousy, confusion and amusement. Despite his initial annoyance, Izuku couldn't help but worry for some reason. It had been two days since the Kiyashi Ward incident. After his encounter with Tamura Shigaraki and being threatened to be killed, he had felt that this training camp was a bad idea. He wasn't afraid of the villain's threat, he was confident that he could easily beat Shigaraki. But something tells him that the villain is planning something big, being bold enough to go to public and threaten the hero. He could just be paranoid at the same time, he could be right. And he hoped it's just the former. Shaking his paranoia away, he looked up to the direction of the bus. Only for his left eye to twitch when he saw Manama and the rest of class 1B. The presence of their sister class wasn't the thing that ticked him off, but it was Manama's crazed look as he spoke up. Ba class 1A need supplementary lessons. That means someone got a failing mark. Manama said with a smug look on his face. Before the copycat could talk some more trash, Izuku cut him off. Wouldn't that mean someone in your class also failed? He said bluntly, making the blonde boy sputter. This earned a smirk on Izuku's face. Too easy. And judging by your reaction, it looks like that person was you. Izuku's guess probably was right when the 1B student looked at him with an angry expression. Manama was about to talk back when he was knocked out by a chop to his neck courtesy of Itsuka. Sorry about Manama. The orange-haired girl said, to which Izuku just waved off. Anyway, how have you been, Midoriya? I'm doing well. Busy with class and patrols as always, but it's manageable. He said to the martial artist. He then caught a glance with the other class 1B students and even waved at Satsuna and Kanoko, the latter of which blushed profusely, something that made Izuku chuckle inwardly. Though, he blinked for three reasons. One, because Ibarra Shiazaki somehow kept her hair vines short, like how he had cut them in the sports festival. Two, the girl he had bumped into back in Kiyashi Ward was also a UA student. No wonder she looked familiar. Three, the fact that some of the guys in class 1B are glaring at him. To be specific, a guy with a mantis mutation, a guy with a bandana, a black-skinned guy with white hair, and a guy with short brown hair and oval-shaped eyes. Izuku ignored them as Class 1B excused themselves when Vlad King arrived and led them to their bus. He waved at them and continued his way towards their designated bus. Looking over at Ieda. Ieda, if you may. He asked a taller boy, who nodded and faced the class. All right everyone Class 1AS bus is here. Please line up and enter the bus, no pushing Ieda said to the class as he chopped invisible onions. The class followed suit. Izuku waited for all of his classmates to enter as he silently did a headcount to make sure no one was left behind. Counting 21, minus himself of course, he began to walk towards the bus. Well, that's until. Izuku that's what he heard before a pink blur tackled, or in class 1AS perspective, speared him to the ground. Groaning at the weight on top of him, he looked down and saw pink. With a sigh he spoke up. Dagnabit, May. Why do you keep doing that? He wheezed out, trying his best to ignore the soft mountains pressing on his chest. Why are you here anyway? He asked, blushing red. Oh I'm here to join class 1A and B for research purposes. You know, studying your quirks to make new babies. She said. Adder Power Loader got tired of you blowing everything up and had ordered you to come with us as they repair the support class workplace. Izuku asked rhetorically. May just smiled wider. I admit nothing, I'll take that as a yes. Izuku sighed and shook his head. Classic May. He thought and looked at her with a deadpan expression. Can you get off me now? This is getting embarrassing. He. Don't be like that, Aizu. She said, looking up to him with a wide smile. You know you love me. As she said that, she nuzzled closer to his chest, making Izuku shudder at the contact. Not wanting to be chewed on by Ieda for May's somewhat affectionate gesture or getting his embarrassment to reach new heights, Izuku raised his hand and lightly chopped her on top of her head. That caused her to stop nuzzling, much to his relief. Hey what was that for? She cried out and pouted. That's for tackling me like a bull. Now, can you please get off me? We really need to go to the bus before Mr. Azawa scolds us. May continued pouting but got off of him, albeit reluctantly. Izuku stood up and dusted his pants before looking over at May. That's when he noticed that she had her salmon dreads on a ponytail that actually looked good on her. Giving her a smile, he reached out and took a strand of her loose dreadlocks and placed them behind her ears. Before she knew it, Izuku pulled her in a hug. I missed you, May. He whispered. The gesture caused her to turn beet red and her heart to flutter. Giggling a bit, she returned the hug. I missed you too, Aizu. She said, not so secretly sniffing his clothes. It took them a solid 18.02 seconds of hugging before they let go, and Izuku led her to the bus. 
Izuku introduced her to the class, oblivious by the jealous pouts from her female classmates, as Mei gave them a victory sign and a wink, adding to their jealousy. Though, Izuku noticed that Iida backed away from Mei, which was fair remembering what happened back in the sports festival. Probably traumatized by her. They went to their seats and with Azawa already entering the bus and sitting in front, the bus started moving. The whole bus ride was steady and nothing much happened, besides Izuku threatening Aoyama to cut his legs if he didn't stop standing up during the ride. Azawa looked back at the class and observed them conversing with each other. Looking away, he slumped back to his seat. Their days of monkeying around like this are numbered. He thought as the bus ride continued. Izuku, sitting at the farthest seat, looked around his classmates. He could see the excited looks in their eyes and how they have been waiting for this moment of calm and relaxation, even Mei who was happily conversing with her seatmate, Melissa about support items. It made him laugh how different the two girls are, Mei being loud and eccentric, while Melissa is graceful and humble. Leaning back to his seat, he could see from the corner of his eye that Katsuki was texting someone with his phone. He could see the slight twitch on the blonde boy's lips and raised a brow when Bakugo's ears began to redden. Hmm, a girl perhaps. I'm happy for him. Izuku thought and smiled a bit before looking away. He was really happy with how Bakugo is becoming after the internship. He was calmer and rarely screamed profanities. Though he was still loud, that was normal for a blonde-haired Bakugo. Their interactions were also different from how they were before. Bakugo now calls him by his name and does not insult him anymore, nor attack him. After the exams and Izuku waking up from his nap and after their supper, Katsuki asked him to go outside to talk. That was the time where Katsuki officially apologized to Izuku for all that he had done and said to him. Izuku was even taken aback when the blonde boy had offered his quirk to be copied as a way to prove that he is really sorry. Despite the apology appearing genuine, Izuku had told the blonde boy that he can't really forgive him for a decade's worth of torment and pain that he had felt on Katsuki's hand. He told him that it'll take time for him to forgive him, something that the blonde boy understood. Izuku initially declined explosion to be copied, but Katsuki insisted on sharing his quirk as an olive branch to mend their relationship. Though reluctant, Izuku accepted the quirk and took a small prick on the blonde's palm as they shook hands while Blacklight copied explosion. With explosion now in his arsenal, Izuku can use it to gain speed when using glide, and also combining it with pop-off allowed him to create balls that would stick on their target before exploding. He also gave tips for Katsuki with his quirk, like a concentrated blast that can pierce through armor or hard surfaces. They also began hanging out and even playing games with Kirishima and the rest of the boys. Though they still see each other as rivals, he is happy that their relationship is now being fixed. That's until a sudden feeling of foreboding entered his mind as he looked straight to his homeroom teacher. Why does it feel like something bad is about to happen? He thought and looked worriedly at Mei. His train of thought was interrupted when the bus suddenly stopped. With that the class began to exit the bus, following Izawa. Izuku was the last out of the bus and immediately noticed that they weren't in a bus stop. But rather, they stopped near the mountainside, by a cliff. Wait, this isn't a bus stop. Where's class 1B? Those were his classmates' thoughts and worries as Izuku walked an inch closer to Mei. He was sure that something was off about this stop. Eyeing his homeroom teacher with suspicion he was about to say something when Izawa beat him to it. To say there's no ulterior motive would be a lie. The hero said in his usual tone of voice, making Izuku look at him with narrowed eyes. What does he mean by that? He, eraser it's been a while a familiar voice called out from the side, making Izuku look. As he did his eyes widened. No way. Your feline fantasies are here, perfectly cute and cat-like heroes, we're the wild wild. Hussy cats. But that the Mandalay and Pixie Bob, two of four members of the hero team, the wild wild hussy cats struck a pose, while the boy of Eerie's age, if not younger, wearing a red cap with yellow horns, stood by them. A frown on his face as he looked at the class. I'd like to introduce the pro heroes, the wild wild hussy cat. They are one of the four hero teams that founded the Union Affair office. As always said, in his usual tired voice. They specialize in mountain rescue operations and are veterans in their field, they've got 12 years of experience in that field. I'm 18 at heart Pixie Bob interjected. They will be the ones who would be helping you all in training your quirks to improve them. As always said, completely unfazed by Pixie Bob's interjection. The class and May were in awe at the sight of the wild wild hussy cats. They all have varying expressions at the sight of the heroines. The girls were a bit insecure at the two women's attractively fit bodies, while some of the boys looked away with blushes in their faces at the hexy sight. That includes Izuku, who was looking anywhere but the heroines, especially Mandalay. Let it be known that Mandalay was Izuku's childhood crush. Though, Izuku was a bit confused when he heard Pixie Bob's voice. He would have sworn he heard her voice before, he just couldn't remember where. Yup this entire area is more or less our domain. Mandalay said, looking over at the forest and mountains from the railing of the cliff. 
The place you'll be staying at is on the base of that mountain. She trailed off. This made Izuku feel suspicious. Looking at the base of the mountain, his eyes narrowed. Something's not right here. He thought as he silently began channeling his quirk. Ha. Huh. Then why did we stop if we were only halfway there? Achako asked, confusion can be heard from her voice. Don't tell me. Sato started, realization entering his eyes as a bead of sweat began to trail down his forehead. The rest of the class began taking steps backward. Let's hurry back to the bus. Please. Hanta said nervously, as he began turning towards the direction of the bus. It's 9.30 am right now. Mandalay started, causing some of them to flinch in her somewhat eerily sweet voice, as her tail began to wag from side to side. If you kick it up a notch, you'll all be there by 12. Seeing the threat, they paled as they all began to run back to the bus, yelling at each other to go back in a hurry. The kittens that don't make it before 12.30 won't be eating. The red-haired heroine said. Though, she was confused when she saw all of them run away except for one. I'm sorry everyone. As always said, looking over at the retreating students, who were halted by Pixie Bob landing in front of them. But your school trip has already started. As he does so, Pixie Bob activates her quirk. Well, at least that's what the trio of heroes expected. Huh. My quirk the blonde heroine cried out in confusion. The rest also looked at her with the same confused look, until class 1A and Azawa realized what had happened. Azawa was confused how Izuku could have used erasure without even looking over at Pixie Bob. He activated his quirk on Izuku to release the erasure on Pixie Bob, but he too couldn't feel his quirk. This just increased his confusion. Let's all calm down for a second. Izuku said, causing everyone to look over at his direction. He began to turn towards the crowd and showed them his glowing crimson eyes, black scleras and floating hair. Just from the visuals, it would be obvious that Izuku combined erasure with sonar senses, making the effectiveness of the quirk grow tenfold. As much as I would love to go down there and Dester beat up whatever it is down there to go to the base, but there is a small detail that you three kinda forgot to realize. He said to the heroes as he pointed at Mei. Not everyone on this trip is a hero core student. The two heroines looked over at Hatsune with wide eyes and turned towards Azawa, who just looked at Izuku with a serious expression. But before he could talk, Izuku cut him off. I'm not complaining nor thinking that she is going to be a liability, she is more than capable of keeping herself safe with her awesome inventions. But what if it wasn't her but another support hero or Heka general education student? He smiled at Mei, who gave him a grin, though a blush could be seen dusting her cheeks. I'm disappointed that for someone who likes to think logically, you are being quite illogical, Eraser. Izuku said, using his pro hero card to lecture his teacher. Everyone was shocked by the sight of Izuku crossing his arms and lecturing Azawa. They were conflicted whether to laugh or be concerned. Sighing, Azawa silently chuckled. Who would have thought that I'd be lectured by one of my students for being illogical? By the problem child of all people. I think I'm getting soft. Right, sorry. The underground hero said, causing the rest to widen their eyes. Eraser had just apologized for his mistake. That's new. I just want you all to be alert in your surroundings and prepare your minds for a future villain confrontation. I see, I understand. Sorry for ruining your plan. Izuku said, bowing but not deactivating his quirk. Next time, when you plan things like this, inform me. I could always help out in increasing the difficulty. He said with a smirk as he glanced at Todoroki. That caused the class to shiver in fear, flashbacks of the final exams returning into their minds. It's obvious that he was still annoyed at Todoroki for calling Izuku his brother-in-law or dad earlier this morning. So. Are we cancelling the plan, Eraser? Mandalay asked. No need to cancel it. We'd be happy to continue with it. Izuku said, smiling and ignoring the shocked expressions of his classmates. And besides, I'm pretty sure Mei wouldn't want to hang out with older people. I'm 18 at heart plus, she can observe us up close to get ideas for her babies. That caused a grin to appear in the support student's face. But that being said, Izuku released the quirk and scooped Mei, who was surprised and startled by the sudden action, into a bride's carry, as dragon wings sprouted from his back as he jumped down the railing to the forest below. As Izuku did that, Pixie Bob used her quirk and made the ground move, causing the rest of the class to be pushed or flung off the cliff. Feel free to use your quirks in our domain as you see Fit Mandalay called out from the railing of the cliff. You have three hours use your own feet to get to the facility through this forest of magic beast. The class dug themselves out of the dirt and dusted themselves. They began grumbling on how UA was notorious on these types of simulations. That's until an earth beast suddenly appeared out of the foliage causing them to panic. Koda tried to use his quirk on it, only to find out that it was useless. Before they could make a move, black and red spikes erupted from the ground and impaled the dirt creature, making it crumble to bits. That didn't go unnoticed by Pixie Bob, who felt one of her beasts got destroyed. The class looked over at the direction where the spikes came from and saw Izuku, wielding his claws and stabbing the ground. 
Removing his claws off the ground, he looked at the crumbled dirt beast on the ground. So that's Pixie Bob's quirk. Interesting. He thought as he looked over at his class. What are you guys waiting for? Let's crush these so-called beasts and get some lunch he smirked when he saw their shock turn to determination, even May was pumped up. He walked towards his classmate and placed his hand in the center. The class followed suit. Plus Ultra in 3. 1, 2, 3. Plus Ultra, 12.35, p.m. Well, guys are an interesting bunch. Mandalay greeted the disheveled students. I'm surprised that you guys got through the forest quite easily. When I told you that you can reach the base by 12, I mean by our standards. All of the students' eyes twitched. How obnoxious. They thought simultaneously. It wasn't really surprising. Azawa whispered, looking over at Izuku. A smile hidden in his scarf. I thought you'd take longer. Pixie Bob chuckled. To have figured out my awakened earth beast so quickly and easily. You guys are good. Especially, her expression turned sultry and pointed at Izuku. You. Me? Izuku blinked and pointed to himself. Your lack of hesitation and indecisiveness. I take it that comes from your experiences you have acquired after being a pro. She began to walk towards Izuku as she licked her lips. Her expression then turned a bit dramatic as she rushed Izuku with her arms flailing. I call dibs on this kitten I'll groom him myself she said as she began spitting on Izuku. The class were speechless at the sight of the woman spitting. Uh, Mandalay. Is she always like this? Azawa asked. It's gotten a lot worse lately ever since the sports festival. She's at the age to take a mate the red-haired woman said. I mean who wouldn't? That boy is built like a Greek god, even I wish she cut herself off and shook her head. Hearing what Mandalay had said, Izuku, who was desperately trying his best to cover his face, remembered where he heard her voice. If he wasn't mistaken, Pixie Bob was the woman who yelled marry me back in the sports festival. That's when a thought came in his mind. Speaking of mates. Don't speak Pixie Bob said as she placed her paw glove over Izuku's face. Izuku continued talking. I've been wondering for a while. Whose child is that? He said as he pointed over at the boy wearing the red cap with yellow horns. As he pointed, he failed to notice the black and red tendrils of black light swirling as it soaked Pixie Bob's saliva. Mandalay looked behind her and saw who Izuku was pointing at. Oh, no, that's my nephew. Kota come and say hi, you're going to be living with them for the next week. She waved the boy, now known as Kota, to come closer. But the boy didn't move or make any attempt to do so, and continued to stare at the hero students with a frown on his face. Being able to escape Pixie Bob's grasp, Izuku walked towards Kota. Smiling, he lowered himself a bit and reached out his hand to the boy. Uh, hey my name's Izuku Midoriya, I'm studying hero studies at UA High. Nice to meet you the rest of his words were cut off when the boy punched him in the family jewels. The rest of the boys, even Izawa, flinched and unconsciously touched their own family jewels. The girls were baffled at what had just transpired. Iida was about to confront the boy for punching Izuku in the nuts when he noticed that Izuku didn't even look hurt. Blinking in surprise, he looked over at Izuku and asked. Midoriya. Are you okay? Izuku just blinked and turned to Iida. Uh yeah. Despite Izuku's reassurance, Iida confronted the boy. You the nephew get back here and apologize to Midoriya. I'm not going to buck around with a bunch of losers who want to grow up to be corny ass heroes. Kota said, not even looking back and ignoring Mandalay's calls. Buck around how old are you the spectacle teen called out. Itsuki snorted in amusement. Huh, kids got spunk. He said with an amused smirk. Reminds you of yourself. Shodo and Shinso said simultaneously. The buck did you two emo say. He yelled out to the two. Relax. It was a joke. Todoroki said. Or was it? Shinso smirked. Guys. It's alright. I'm fine. Izuku reassured Iida and the rest of his classmates. H how are you still standing? Echako said, walking towards him. They were confused when Izuku suddenly laughed. You guys always forget that I have shock nullification. He said, causing a wave of understanding nods coming from his classmates. Shock nullification. Eraser, I thought his quirk was blacklight. Mandalay asked. It's complicated. He just said, which didn't really answer her question but just shrugged. Anyway, enough chit chat, go and get your luggage on the bus. Once you've settled into your rooms, grab dinner in the dining hall. After that, take a bath, kick back and unwind. The real deal starts tomorrow, roll out. He said before walking into the base. The students after saying yes sir they turned away and began walking to the bus. They were still worried about Izuku, but he insisted that he was fine and went to the bus to fetch their stuff. As they did that, Izuku couldn't help but look back to the base. He was something in Kota that he knew very well. Pain. The boy was in so much pain. He doesn't know what caused that pain, but he knows that it was there. And being a hero, he couldn't help but feel the urge to help the boy and do Rin move on from what's causing him that pain. His train of thought was cut off when a wave of unfamiliar memories entered his mind. 
You have got to be kidding me. Chapter 31. Red Cap with Yellow Horns. Izuku leaned back into the stone wall interior of the hot spring onsen and let out a sigh of relief as his muscles felt the relaxing sensation of the warm water. It was 5.30 in the afternoon and Class 1A decided to take a soak in the onsen to relax their bodies before going to bed. The hot springs are separated by gender in order to keep the boys and girls separated. Much to the not-so-secret disappointment of most of the girls, mainly Mina, Toru, Sayu, Himiko, and Mei. Looking around, Izuku can't see his classmates having the same relaxed reactions, while some Kaminari, Siro, and Kirishima are splashing water onto Katsuki, who was yelling profanities at the trio. Iida stood up, attempting to calm down the explosion user to no avail, as the rest just snickered at them. Izuku looked at them with a smile, remembering their smiles earlier this afternoon after lunch. Since they arrived at the place earlier than the heroes expected, they were given the chance to spend some leisure time. In which they used well to their enjoyment. Though he made sure to keep erasure up, he heard his classmates joking around how it would only take one sneeze before Kaminari fries everyone in the water. Izuku knew it was a joke, but it bothered him. That's why he was using erasure. Better safe than fried. Some of them used that time to enjoy stuff like playing outdoor games, studying the area, sightseeing, and some of them even just enjoyed napping under the foliage of the thick trees. Despite them being hero trainees, they are still teenagers, they deserve some time off even if it is just hours. He too made himself comfortable by sleeping under the trees and felt the cool afternoon breeze pass by him. Though, he was confused and shocked to wake up with Kayoka sleeping beside him, her head leaning onto his shoulder. He inwardly chuckled remembering the girl trying to explain herself while her face was beet red. However, despite all of this relaxation plus them training tomorrow, something inside him still feels like something big is about to happen. Izuku wasn't sure why, but he could picture a large event happening in the next couple of days. He just wasn't sure what that event was. Sighing to himself, he placed his arms behind his head as he looked up. Doing so made him blink as he could see someone on top of the wall separating the bathhouses. Through the mist that the hot springs are producing, he could see a tiny figure perched on top. He narrowed his eyes to decipher who the person was. That is when he noticed a silhouette of a cap with horns, and he recognized who it was. Hadi was about to call out for the boy when Iida beat him to it. You what are you doing up there it's dangerous you might fall the blue haired boy said, walking out of the hot water of the hot springs. Izuku saw the young boy scowling at them. I'm here to make sure you idiots don't do something stupid the boy yelled back, glaring daggers at the engine user. Oh, that's so thoughtful of you Kota. You rock, Kota. Izuku heard Toru and Mina from the other side of the wall and made the boy turn. Before they knew it the boy was falling down the wall. Iida was about to jump towards the falling boy when a blur of red, black, and green snatched the boy out of the air, preventing an accident from happening. The boys blinked owlishly at what just happened. They looked at the person carrying the boy in his hands and saw Izuku, black light swirling on his lower body as black shorts appeared, covering him. Izuku excused himself from the group and carried Kota out of the onsen. He was going to bring him to Mandalay and tell her what had happened. They were thinking of two things. One, how did he reach the boy without the water getting disturbed? Second, how the hell does he got a bigger pee? Looks like he just passed out from a fear of falling. Thanks. Mandalay said to Izuku, wearing nothing but the shorts he summoned. The heroine did her best to not look failing miserably onto the boy's exposed body as flashbacks of the sports festival bombarded her mind. Calm down, Shino. He may be a pro, but he's still a kid. She reminded herself as she shook her head. Thankfully, Izuku didn't notice her stealing glances at him as he continued to look at Kota's sleeping form. The moment he saw the boy, despite Kota showing a rude expression, Izuku could see the pain in his eyes. It was something that ticked off the hero side of him. Kota. He started, making the heroine look in his direction. He. Doesn't seem too keen on the concepts of heroes. I grew up around a lot of people who wanted to become heroes, me included. He said, eyes still glued on the unconscious boy. A kid this young being so jaded. It's something I've never really seen before. Yeah. She started. It shouldn't come as a surprise, but there are many out there who aren't fans of heroes. I know a few. Izuku thought, as an image of Shigaraki entered his mind. If he had a normal upbringing he would have grown to idolize heroes as well. That caught Izuku's attention. Normal. He asked. Izuku saw the red-haired heroine sigh as she squeezed the towel and placed it over the unconscious boy's forehead. She looked deep in thought contemplating if she should tell him. Good thing she didn't need to decide as Pixie Bob entered the room. Mandalay's cousins. Coda's parents, the blonde woman started in an uncharacteristically serious tone. They used to be heroes. But they lost their lives on the job. Izuku stared at the moon as he remembered what the two heroines said to him. Coda's parents, the water hose heroes, died in their job. They died at the hands of a ruthless villain. When he was young, Izuku remembered seeing the duo on television. 
They had made a name for themselves as rescue heroes, prioritizing rescue over fighting villains. Izuku often saw them putting out all fire-related problems throughout Japan. He even saw them in their neighborhood once, when there was a fire caused by a fleeing villain with a fire quirk. The duo were able to stop the fire from spreading in the neighborhood Mustafu. Despite being rescue heroes, they also have strong water-based quirks that they use to fight villains back when they were alive. According to Mandalay, they had excellent mastery over their quirks that they injured the villain that killed them so hard that said villain was forced to retreat to hiding. They were praised for their sacrifice and heroism, but at what cost? Because of it, Kota grew bitter and hated anything that revolved around heroes, besides the WWPC. Izuku understands this. Losing one parent is hard to accept, Izuku knows this, even if he never met his father, the emptiness of missing a part of a family, reflected on how Izuku grew up before he got his quirk. But to feel the pain of losing both his parents at such a young age. No child deserves to feel that pain. To push those around you and hate the ones that dreamed of becoming a hero. Izuku wished he could help the boy out on getting out of the sadness and pain. Like how he saved Todoroki from Endeavor's shackles. Like how he saved Iida from committing a crime. Like how he unintentionally saved Bakugo from his arrogant self. Like how he saved Iri and Himiko from overhaul. But most importantly, like how Alex had saved him from losing his dream. He wanted to save Koda too, but how? The moon is beautiful, isn't it? A voice came from behind him, breaking him out of his thoughts. Looking behind him, he met eyes with the person who had just called him. Hey, why are you still up? Izuku asked as the person made their way close to him. The person just raised the glass of water they were holding as the person continued walking towards him. I got thirsty. I was walking back when I noticed you from the window. Izuku looked over at the base's window where the person pointed. How about you? Why are you still awake and out here? Izuku shrugged and looked up at the moon. I couldn't sleep. He said blankly. He wasn't entirely lying. He couldn't sleep due to his metabolism getting enhanced by his quirk, making it hard for him to sleep at night. Add in the worry paranoia building in his stomach about this camp and Koda's dilemma. Are you okay? He could feel the worry coming from the person's stare. Looking back at them, his eyes soften at the emotion seen in their eyes. Izuku gave them a small reassuring smile and nodded. Taking their left hand, causing a small yelp from the person. Yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. As he said that, he gave the hand a small squeeze. Okay then. But if you need someone to talk to, I'm. I mean, we're always here for you. He could still see the uncertainty in their eyes before it turned into understanding. He nodded again, smiling. Of course. Thank you. He said. As soon as he said that, the person looked at him for a few seconds before walking closer to him and raising a hand on his shirt's collar. He was confused at this action and was about to ask. That is when he was pulled down as something soft had impacted on his lips. He was surprised by the gesture, but didn't pull away as he let the kiss happen. As fast as it happened, it was the same as they pulled away. A quick simple kiss, but Izuku could feel the passion and emotions through it alone. Izuku with red staining his freckled cheeks, stared at the person in front of him. No. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. The person said, cheeks changing into a rosy hue as the person ran away back to the base, leaving Izuku to stare at them as their hair reflected the moon's light. Yup, definitely not sleeping tonight. He thought as he lowered his head. He was about to go inside when he felt something weird, as if someone was looking at him. Using his sonar senses, he looked around and saw something suspicious deep in the forest. What the heck is that? He thought as he approached it. Second day of the school trip, 5.45 a.m., of class 1b, improve our quirks. Kendo asked, walking out of the base, stretching her arms as she did so. She reached to catch Kanoko, who almost fell down due to her drowsiness. They arrived late last night and it was made obvious by their still sleepy expressions. Lad King, 1BS homeroom teacher, nodded at his class. Class 1AS already started, let's get going he said, pumping his fists. They got to stand out in the sports festival, it's our turn now. Thought it it's our time to shine the hero said loudly, causing some of his students to sweat drop, while some were touched. Our humblest apologies, sir sorry we're worthless students. Some of class 1B thought, as Tetsutetsu wiped a manly tear that escaped his left eye. You talk about improving our quirks. We've got 20 unique abilities divided amongst us. What do we improve on and how? Tokage asked, still sleepy. Could you be more specific? Tagaru Kamakiri, a boy with a mantis-like appearance, said, crossing his arms. His eyes appeared annoyed and impatient. Muscle fibers break under constant abuse and become stronger and thicker. Vlad King turned around and waved his class to follow him. Your quirks are the same, keep using them and they will become stronger. If you don't, they wither away. In other words, there is but one thing to do he said as he stopped in front of a clearing. Go beyond your limits class 1B followed suit. Stopping next to their homeroom teacher, what greeted them almost made their eyes bulge out. 
in front of them, class 1A doing different types of exercises to improve their quirks. These exercises are as follows. Itsuki dipping his hands on boiling water before lifting them up into the air and releasing a large explosion. Shoto sits inside another barrel that is over a fire, occasionally using his fire and ice respectively. Echako is in a floating Zorb ball, face looking like she was about to throw up. Momo and Rikido are consuming a lot of food while they use their quirk. On the side, Mashirao can be seen slapping his tail on Aijiru's heart and face. Close to them is Melissa and Himiko doing a sparring session, the former has yellow lightning surrounding her, while the latter is randomly changing her face into some of their classmates. Melissa sends punches and kicks towards the other blonde girl, while Himiko dodges every attack using her natural flexibility. On the side of the mountain, Sayu can be seen crawling up said mountain with her tongue outstretched. Denki is holding two wires connected to a generator, letting the electric charge of the generator flow right through him. Hanta with his elbows pointed upward, released a very long strand of tape from his elbow. Same goes for Yuga, who was releasing a laser out of his belt, face pale and in pain. The beam of laser hitting Toru, well in this case a spot where Toru is standing, using her quirk to redirect the beam of laser to a different side. On the same mountain cliff, Hitashi and Koji are screaming their hearts out. Below that mountain is a cave where Fumikage stayed, calling out Dark Shadow. With him was Mezu, wearing a blindfold and earplugs as he summoned extra eyes and ear from his duply arm. Outside that cave, Kyoka can be seen using her earphone jacks to stab onto the stone, while Mina who was a few feet away from her, uses her acid to melt the stone. As they all were doing this, Tenya circled around them with his quirk activated, at a speed that was almost as fast as All Might. Class 1B looked on at their sister class, and some of them began sweating at how intense the training Class 1A is doing. Normally, we adjust the training based on physical growth. Vlad King said as he looked around. Ah, but we don't have time to laze around Class 1B. As Awa interjected, walking towards them. Itsuka used that time to talk. With us included, we've got 42 people. She started and looked around at the other class. Can six people really handle that many quirks at once? She asked at teachers. Her classmates nodded in agreement. Azawa nodded. That's why they're here. He said looking to the side. That's right four minds, one body they look towards the direction of the voice. Your feline fantasies are here. Allow us to lend a helping paw. Perfectly cute and cat-like heroes. We're the wild wild hussy cats. Class 1B stared at the three heroines as they struck a pose. With my quirk search, I can observe and monitor up to 100 people at a time ragdoll, a woman with emerald green hair, wearing a yellow costume, said from her spot their location, and weak points too. My earth flow will create a training ground fit for every last one of you, Pixie Bob said as she made a boulder from the mountain and let it roll off. And with my telepath, I can advise and instruct multiple people at once. Mandalay said, smiling at the students. After they said that, Vlad King spoke up. Only you three. Where's Tiger? He asked the trio. Mandalay chuckled sheepishly. Yeah. About that. As she was about to continue, Monoma looked around with a bored look and stopped when he saw Izuku just sitting under a tree with his eyes closed and hands behind his head. The blonde boy scoffed. You tell us to not laze around, but he's not doing anything. He said loudly, pointing at Izuku. Everyone beside Class 1A looked at Izuku's direction. Some of the class agreed with Monoma's statement, while some were just confused as to why he isn't doing anything. Before they could continue talking, Izuku spoke up. Five steps backward. The class and Vlad King blinked. Before they could ask why, they noticed Azawa and the WWPC took five steps backward. They, minus Monoma, who was still berating Izuku for slacking off and began belittling him, followed suit. As they did that, Iida sped past them, leaving a cloud of dust which had enveloped Monoma. The blonde boy began coughing and sneezing. The heroines just chuckled at the boy, making the rest of the class laugh. Monoma just continued glaring at Izuku, who opened his eyes and looked at the new arrival. Class 1B were shocked to see his eyes appeared to be crimson or eyes with black squares. Huh? Oh hey guys how have you guys been? He said as he stood up from his spot and began doing some stretches. Before they could respond, Izuku looked over at the heroes. You guys may need to check on Aoyama, he just collapsed. Ragdoll widened her eyes before using her quirk. Seeing that Izuku was right, she excused herself and ran towards Aoyama's spot. As for Tiger, he's resting right now. Izuku said. Mandalay nodded. Right. As I was saying before I was rudely interrupted. She said glaring at Monoma. Tiger is resting at the base. During his session with Midoriya, they got too excited and went all out. And let's just say Midoriya here can pack a punch. She teased Izuku, who just raised his hand. I would like to point out that it wasn't my idea to go all out. He defended himself. Plus, I only hit him with a tenth of my strength. He whispered the last part, but Class 1B heard it loud and clear. He was able to knock out Tiger with just a tenth of his strength. 
they thought as they began sweating. Amakiri gritted his teeth and stomped his way over Izuku. Fight me. He said to the blacklight user. Izuku looked at him for a second before responding. How about no? He said, walking away from them. What? Are you scared? A boy with a bandana mocked him. The president of class 1A just stared at them with a deadpan expression. I face down the USJ Nomu, Shigaraki, Stain, and a lot of villains. They are a lot more intimidating than Hopper over there. He said before turning around. He glanced at the heroes and saw Vlad King and Izawa, Nod and Shrug, respectively. Though, if you really want to fight, then I'll humor you. He said, summoning black light around his hands, but not much to make weapons. Hum at me with everything you got. He said as some of the guys charged him. Passed forward, 4.30 p.m., Izuku carried a plate with rice and curry as he walked up a mountain path leading up. This was the way he saw Koda go and tracked him using his sonar senses. After their training session, Class 1A and Class 1B took quick showers before going out for dinner. Arriving outside, Pixie Bob and Ragdoll inform them that they'll be cooking curry, much to the disappointment of both classes. Both classes formed their own groups and helped out each other cook their respective curries. Izuku watched as his class helped each other with cooking the curry. Though, when he looked over at their sister class, he was confused to see that they were having a hard time making fire for their pots. Not wanting for them to have a hard time, he approached them and ignored the glares sent towards him by the guys that he beat earlier this morning. He walked over their pots and using half hot half cold, he helped them make fire for their pots. Itsuka and the other girls thanked him for his help, while the boys that didn't fight him, gave him nods. He still ignored the glares sent to him by the other guys, as he went back to his class to help out with cooking. It was until they were starting to eat and he took a few bites when he noticed Kota walking away from the base. Not wanting the boy to starve, he finished his plate and took a different plate and filled it with food. It took him a few minutes to reach Kota's direction. The boy was sitting on the ground and staring at the forest, his red cap shadowing his eyes from the moonlight. Nice place you got here kid. Izuku said, looking at the forest below. The boy was surprised to see him there, but hid it well in the glare he sent Izuku. A place where you can see the entirety of the forest and feel the cool night breeze. How did you know I was here the boy yelled at him. Hmm? Oh, sorry. I saw you walk this way and followed your footprints. I brought some curry, figured you hadn't had anything to eat. He was cut off when Koda interjected. I'm fine, I don't need any. What part of I don't want to buck around you losers did you not understand? This is my secret base, you're not welcome here. The boy said, still glaring at him. Secret base, huh? Izuku said, inwardly amused at the boy's foul mouth. The boy continued talking about how pathetic they were for bragging about their quirks. He was tempted to tell the boy off about them training their quirks to become heroes, but he stopped himself from talking as he remembered his talk with Mandalay and Pixie Bob last night. This is probably the first time he is releasing his anger. Might as well let him be. Izuku just kept his mouth shut as he let the boy vent out all his anger. Screw you. You've all got a couple of screws loose. The boy continued. Calling yourselves heroes and villains. Killing each other like idiots. That made Izuku look towards the boy. Not just quirks and heroes. The hero society itself. He thought. Bragging about your quirk. That's why you end up like that. Bucking idiots. Izuku decided that it was enough. So you hate quirks, heroes and villains. He said in a low tone. The boy glared harder at him. So what if I do? So you hate Mandalay then? She's a hero after all. That caught the boy off guard. Well no. I, you hate Pixie Bob, Ragdoll, and Tiger as well. They are all heroes too. I I uh. And you hate your parents. The water hose. That made the boy widen his eyes. How did you? Koda was cut off when Izuku walked forward and placed the plate on a flat stone. He then looked up to the moon. I know you're in pain, Koda. And I understand that you hate the hero society. Just that. Don't let that pain push away those who genuinely care for your well-being. Izuku turned around to leave. Don't let that hate consume you because trust me nothing good will happen if your heart is filled with hatred. Trust me, I know. He said as he left the boy to his own thoughts. I know very well. He thought as he remembered how he, as Alex Mercer, became a monster that almost destroyed humanity. In a different part of the mountain ledge towering over the forest, a group of figures stood there observing the forest and listening into the distant chattering of students. The throbs. Pulses. Let's hurry up and go. A gruff voice said, clearly impatient. It's not time yet. Also, didn't I tell you we don't have to overdo it? A youthful voice said under a gas mask. Yeah, quit trying to act like the boss. Another voice said. We're only here to send a warning flare this time. These heroes, riddled with holes. Will fall to the earth. A man with black hair and severe burn marks and stitches on his face and arms said, staring at the distant light of the base. All for the sake of a brighter future. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. 
Also check out my other video that has been shown in left. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day. Bye.